physician had a drink before. <laughs> That's it. Very early. Yeah. At least the at least the weather is clear up. It's not so yeah. It's not quite as intimidating as it was earlier. So. Right. And I do know there's at least five coming. Hi. Hey. How's it going? All right. How are you? Good. Good. streaming now and then I post it later. It was surprisingly easy to transfer it to your name. Uh, so we're going to start a little bit late, I guess, as usual. No, you gotta go on um, on YouTube. Are you the speaker? Yes. Here you go. Let me just put this on. No, um, this is locked. What's locked? Yeah, you can clip it wherever you want. So I can monitor. Oh, there's four people watching already. All right. So. Let me know if I should adjust my volume. I'm conscious of not yelling into the, the microphone, but also having others in the room hear me Trying to strike that balance. Five people watching, so five, six. Um, is there a way for me to be able to? Clicker? Yeah. Or no. All right. And 
know oh, like yeah. I guess it's not on the yeah there's no It's all right. I mean, might as well just. Just use. No, but I mean, if you can use it. Does this clicker work? Do you know? No, I don't. That might be connected to the other computer. Yeah, that's basically. The light's going on. I mean, you have a pointer, for sure. Yeah. It's nice. This is yeah. Okay. I guess you're stuck. I'm here looking at this. Yeah, I'm doing it all. <laughs> <laughs> all right, it's cool. He's the kind of one. Franco, it was uh, the bio. Just notice, I don't know if it was me or or you or whatever, but in the oh, it's there. Okay, for whatever reason, it was cut off in some of the announcement. I don't know if it was. Oh, it was uh, cut off. In one of them, that's all. But you have the whole thing. This is what's on the website. Okay, cool. maybe in the, the thing that got email. emailed around. Okay. Sorry. Uh, about that. No, no worries. Okay. Like towards the end, but yeah. Okay. And you started here in September, right? Yeah. Okay, thanks for, for coming to the third of our True Science Talks. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, these talks are, uh, are uh, shown in real time online through our, uh, the Drexel YouTube feed, and they're posted on the truescience.info website where there's opportunity to blog with the speakers or uh, interact with the speakers. Our, two weeks ago, we had um, a focus on healthcare. Last week we had immigration, and this week we have um, Dr. Gabriel Rocha, who is a professor here in the Department of History, started this past fall. Um, and I'm going to give um, just a brief, unfortunately I forgot to print out the bio, so I'll have to read. Um, uh, Dr. De Rocha is an assistant professor of history here. He's a specialist in social environmental history of the early Atlantic uh, world. And he has a book manuscript entitled Empire from the Commons, Political Ecologies of Colonialism in the Early Atlantic. And um, has his PhD from New York University. And today the title of his talk is Environmental Regulations, Perspectives from History, which is sort of really key these days in sort of discussions in the public uh, domain about environmental regulations uh, today. So with that, I'd like to um, just sort of um, mention one quick thing. Sorry, I, the uh, True Science website is here, and if you go to the Health and Healthcare uh, link, you'll see the, the speak there. The Immigrants and Refugees is here, and the Environment tab uh, is where, as of uh, this weekend, uh, you will, right now, you just see the title of the talk and the abstract and the bio, and we'll have the talk there. So I invite you to uh, continue the discussion there. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Rocha, and I will set this up for you. Thank you. 
All right, thank you. Uh, all right, thanks everyone for coming out on this rainy uh, Friday, and thank you to those who are tuning in. Um, I'm excited to, uh, to be a part of this series. Thanks, Franco, for, for organizing it and, and uh, giving me a chance to, to talk with you guys. Um, so I'm going to start by posing a few questions which are going to be familiar to scientists and other scholars undertaking research to address some of the major environmental challenges of our day. Uh, first, what's the role of the state uh, or the uh, regulatory apparatus around environmental matters at the international, federal, regional, or local levels in best supporting a just social order where all can have that, the means to secure the necessities of life? What strategies and approaches toward the environment might allow people of all backgrounds to be the most ethical benefactors and stewards of the ecologies that they inhabit. There's no doubt that uh, in 2017, we live in a moment when our planned, planet's ecosystems are confronting unprecedented human and capital-driven pressures. Environmental scholars hoping to contribute useful answers to the consequential questions that I've posed here are increasingly recognizing the need to cast a wide net of inquiry combining advances in research across various branches of the biological and social sciences and humanities. The, the traditional scientific approach or the, the traditional scholarly posture towards um, environmental studies research uh, for entirely logical reasons has drawn from a broad range of empirical investigations into the current state of various marine and terrestrial ecosystems whether you know, highlighting the devastating effects on biodiversity from rapid deforestation of the rainforests to understanding or trying to understand the, the multiplier effects of melting Arctic ice sheets on the composition of the world's oceans uh, to better understanding the effects of extreme weather events. The list goes on, right? And, uh, and I'm glad here that I'm in the company of other uh, true, science, uh, true science lecturers and, uh, and other talks that are posted on the, uh, as part of the, uh, the Green Infrastructure, Climate, and Cities seminar series available on the website for the Consortium for Climate Risk in the Urban Northeast uh, that, that detail uh, the, some of the, the scientific uh, approaches to the study of climate change today. Now, if there's a, a historical dimension, I'm a historian, so I'm, I'm approaching this uh, from a historical perspective. Um, if there is a historical dimension to the, uh, the, these scholarly investigations into the present state of the environment, um, it usually looks to developments, again, very logically so, uh, developments in the recent past. Okay. Um, specifically, uh, noting the intensifying pace of industrialization and extractivist industries in the global south after World War II, facilitated you know, in large part by finance capital with clear links to the global north. Um, from this perspective, climate change is real, not only because it's prejudicial to the health of the planetary environments, but also because it catalyzes political instability and increases indices of socioeconomic inequality across a variety of national and global contexts. Uh, and the, the historical treatment of this more recent period, the, the so-called Great Acceleration after uh, 1945, also notes uh, and, and, and explanations um, uh, over the rise of the environmentalist movement in the 1960s and 70s, uh, leading most notably in the United States to the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency and on the world stage to a string of international climate accords from Rio in 1992 to Kyoto in 97, Paris in 2015. You, you might be familiar with, uh, with this. Um, but again, uh, the, these international accords, which continue to seek a consensus among nation states to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and therefore ward off the worst effects of climate change. These efforts uh, work from the premise that effective environmental regulations are the answer and that science should be marshaled towards developing better policy proposals. Now, with the rise of Donald Trump to the American presidency, it's currently the case that the United States, arguably the world's largest polluter, 
now has leadership across various branches of the federal government that dabbles or fully embraces in climate change denialism while proclaiming to slash regulations or as uh, the Trump advisor Myron Ebel has put it, to quote, get rid of the regulatory rampage that is killing investments and jobs. Now this has, uh, this sort of anti-regulation, uh, small government approach has long been a, uh, a, a, a discursive strategy of, of the right wing in the US uh, that's, that's currently in power. Um, and uh, in, it has particular uh, effects for environmental policy in, in the US currently uh, at the level of uh, you know, the internal debates in the Trump administration over whether the United States should withdraw from COP21 and other international climate accords. Um, and at the domestic level, uh, even less ambiguous uh, with the appointment of Scott Pruitt to the EPA, um, the open uh, support for corporations directly involved in fossil fuel extraction and resource intensive industries. Right? Uh, building pipelines, peeling back anti-pollution laws, essentially gutting the regulatory capacity of the EPA. And critics of the, this approach uh, will, will, will note um, that, uh, you know, that the gutting the EPA reverses important strides taken since the heyday of the environmentalist movement in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, and in, in sort of this temporal horizon that is generally uh, used to think about the current moment, right? Um, the, uh, the defenders of, uh, of the regulatory capacity of the EPA and other governmental agencies rely on an, environmental, an environmentalist discourse of protecting the environment, right? We need safeguards for clean water, clean air, uh, food that's free of harmful toxins. We need effective regulations, right? Informed by the latest science. Now, I think this has led uh, to a bit of a, discurs of a, a discursive deadlock uh, in terms of the political debates around these issues, where on the one hand, you have uh, proponents, uh, a, a sort of anti-regulation approach, right? Let's do away with regulations. Uh, it's better for, to create jobs, to not have these uh, encumbrances on the free market, uh, whereas uh, the, the opposing camps, which I think is a bit more fractured, uh, will be defending the, 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 uh, the effectiveness of regulations to address uh, some of the worst effects of climate change. My talk today uh, aims to use a perspective from the deeper past, so well before the, the 1960s, uh, to approach this current gridlock or the current deadlock in the political <coughs> discourse over how to, how to approach environmental regulations um, from a new angle, okay? Um, or I should rather say a very old angle that has been lost, I believe, due to the shorter temporal horizon of uh, these scholarly invest investigations into the current state of the planetary environment. So in what follows, I use tools honed by environmental historians and political ecologists to recover aspects of history, uh, of the history of the pre-industrial fisheries of Iberia and North Africa between approximately 1480 and 1530. I hope to show through, uh, through the various case studies and examples that by delving into some of the details about the ways in which fishermen and officials uh, in Iberia in, the, in this period approached their marine environments as a source of sustenance, wealth, and power, even though it was in a radically different historical moment from our own, uh, can show us that popular and state actors struggled continuously over how to manage and benefit from shared ecologies. So at the same time, uh, the, the historical actors I'll be talking about recognized um, as, uh, that the, their ecologies were undergoing profound transformations. Then, as now, people approach the environment through a web of regulations and economic concerns subject to custom and indeterminacy. So uh, the close look that I want to offer today at the deeper past of environmental stewardship shows that social and political collectives laboring to attain their means of subsistence have long grappled with the power of elites, with the power of the state uh, in interacting with the environments upon which they relied. 
Uh, and here I have a kind of a working, uh, a working definition of what I mean by regulations, okay? So by regulations, uh, and, and environmental regulations, I mean the socially recognized norms and rules that govern the general conditions of access and use of fruct or, or use of different elements of a broader ecosystem. Uh, and rather than, uh, than it being a question of, you know, do we regulate or do we not regulate, right, as a, as, a, as a policy question entertained by state actors, I see a broader range of different social and political factions involved in the process of creating a, a regulatory apparatus, okay? And I'll talk more about this, but, but essentially I'm thinking about four different elements, and, and really I think the graph really should be kind of a set of overlapping circles, right? I don't, I don't think of these as entirely separate from one another. But on the one hand, there's the strength of popular custom, the ways in which people have for a long time, uh, and, and across a broad uh, uh, set of, 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 of communities, approached uh, their, their environments and, and, and made a living uh, off of it. Um, there's the ecological flux with which they are interacting. Um, there is... Uh, there, there are questions of economic inequality that, that, that is uh, constantly uh, figures into assessments of the, the state of the environment. And then there are the institutions of governance that try to oversee the ways in which different groups interact with the environment. Right? So, so the, what I want to propose is a view of, uh, of a regulatory apparatus that, that goes beyond the narrow confines of state actors but includes them as part of, of a, an ongoing dynamic. Uh, the takeaway, uh, I hope, is that uh, you know, rather than asking whether or not there should be regulations in place, um, we should recognize that uh, the, the, the questions actually become more about which sectors, right? Institutional actors, economic elites, or, or members of the popular class have the upper hand in setting the terms by which the majority of people relate to their environments. All right, so, so I'm going to turn now to, to a few of these examples from the Iberian and North African fisheries. And then I'm going to return to the contemporary context uh, to make the argument that scholars and scientists seeing their research as beneficial to environmental protection efforts should take more seriously the role of popular actors in originating and implementing sustainable policy. So in other words, I think that there's, rooms, uh, there's room for a, uh, a regulatory framework or, or a vision of the regulatory framework that uh, favors grassroots mobilization uh, at, the, at the local and regional level. So, so, so uh, let's, let's think then. What, <laughs> on the one hand, this is a, a kind of a ridiculous premise that I'm putting here, but you know, what do Iberian fishermen who worked the rivers and waters off the coast of Portugal, Spain, and North Africa 500 years ago tell us about climate change today. Okay. Now, you know, the, I think the, the, the differences are more apparent, right? Uh, uh, this is, uh, here we have a map uh, that was, uh, uh, an atlas that was drawn up in the 1560s um, of the North Atlantic. You have uh, on the bottom right-hand corner, the uh, coast of uh, Western North Africa, uh, you have Portugal there, uh, and, uh, and Northern Europe in the corner there, and uh, the a depiction of uh, the coast of Newfoundland. Uh, and this has uh, the, the fishing expeditions leaving Western Europe to, uh, to Newfoundland during uh, roughly the period that I'll be talking about have received a little bit more attention by historians. Um, but what I found in, in my research in, in archives in, in Portugal and Spain is that there was also a significant uh, and uh, in some ways longer standing uh, tradition of uh, Iberian fishing expeditions down the coast of North Africa uh, beginning approximately in the 1440s, 1450s and extending into the early 16th century. Okay. Um, here's another map that kind of gives you it zooms in a bit more on, so this is from 1546. Uh, again, on the upper right-hand corner, you have the coast of Portugal uh, and then North Africa here. Um, and, and you see uh, you know, the, the depictions of the islands, 
uh, of the Canaries archipelago, Madeira, the Azores, on the upper uh, left quadrant there. So in this pre-industrial world, very different from our own, right? a world still transitioning into a capitalist world system, fishermen and uh, the communities of which they were a part were extremely attuned to the ways in which humans and the other than human worlds were thoroughly enmeshed. Their approach to the environment was in some respects similar to ours today in that their concerns were cross-cut with a host of socioeconomic, legal, and political quandaries. So I'm going to I'm going to be focusing on these Spanish and Portuguese fishermen, uh, the mariners associated with them, the merchants with whom they they engaged in business, and officials that sought to regulate uh, and tax their their activities, uh, all of whom were involved in the the capture and selling of fish uh, throughout this region. Uh, this is a unique time and place, um, but you know as I as I'm proposing here, um, it it can give us some important insights into into our current moment. Um, so I'd like to ask here today then, you know, how did Iberian fishermen and, and their communities and, and the state actors with whom they interacted approach their environments and their marine environments that they, share, they recognize as sharing amongst themselves and with others? Um, now, despite the remoteness of, of their, this era uh, and the fact that uh, many of these actors were unfamiliar with uh, you know, uh, the more modern scientific breakthroughs. Um, Iberian fishermen did perceive the environments, I argue here, through a regulatory paradigm. Uh, the, the members of fishing expeditions and the people who relied on their labor were thoroughly attuned to rules about where and when fishing could occur, what instruments they could use, how much they would be charged in taxes, and by whom, if they caught certain types of species, and so forth. Right? So there's a, an actual, a very complex set of regulatory mechanisms in place during this period that, that is important to keep in mind. Um, so because of the prominence of these different uh, rules and norms that mediating their access, the fishermen's access to the marine environments, um, that is, is why I'm saying that fishing communities seldom consider the environment apart from this regulatory framework. So where did they perceive these environmental regulations as coming from? Uh, when they navigated rivers and estuaries or sea lanes, fishermen contended with different institutions. At the city level, with relation to the crown of Portugal and Spain, uh, through the church, through military orders. Um, and these institutions, the, the actors situated from these, uh, in, in these institutions um, to a great extent, uh, would, would try to oversee uh, and, and uh, uh, regulate the activities of fishermen in the form of fees for access to spe specific fishing grounds. The delineations of the fishing grounds were always subject to debate. You know, where, we're charging you this much to go fish in this part of the coast, but where does this part of the coast begin? Where does it end? Uh, what kind of fishing instruments are we using? What, kind, what time of year are we allowed to go here? Et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the other major uh, aspect of the regulatory mechanism during this period involved taxes on the transactions that fishermen uh, would engage in after they brought back their haul of fish to market. Okay. Uh, these taxes, again, different institutions would try to collect different types of taxes. Uh, they would change them on a yearly basis uh, as a function of different types of uh, their assessment of the ecological conditions with which the fishermen were contending. So essentially, uh, so on the one hand, you have these institutional attempts at oversight, right? Uh, but essentially, I, I think a, a more productive way to think about it is that you have an institutional apparatus that's made up of different, you know, whether the city or the church or, uh, or the crown, right, uh, that, that were cashing in on the strength of custom, the strength of sort of standing habits, okay, uh, and, and the, the, the existence of particular environmental dynamics. They were cashing in on how people had for a long time, you know, wrested sustenance and wealth from their environments. Um, so 
long before the scientific method rose to prominence as an ethos of inquiry, aspiring towards objectivity based on observation, the fishermen that I'll be talking about here were empiricists, grappling with concurrent environmental, economic, political, and social changes. And to paraphrase the, the historian Richard White, these were people who knew nature through labor. And while they dealt with a biodiversity, that, uh, a marine biodiversity that, that has been severely compromised in recent centuries, their knowledge of the complexity and interconnectedness of marine ecosystems was much deeper and more widespread than I think is often realized today. So let me give an example uh, to, of evidence that, that bears some of these, my interpretations out. Okay. Um, so periodically in medieval Portugal and Spain, the crown uh, would convene an assembly of the different estates. This was called the Cortes. Okay. Uh, so the different estates being the clergy, the nobility, and the commoners. Uh, and, and here, you uh, can't see it that well. It's a, a book of uh, the, the sort of records of the Cortes from Portugal from the uh, early 1480s, where you have essentially different groups uh, petitioning the, the king. They have an audience before the crown. Uh, they put forth a series of complaints uh, and asking for the, the crown's assistance um, in... Uh, sorry. Oh, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so you can see a little better. It's kind of a dark picture. Um, uh, and, and this was a forum for different groups uh, and individuals to voice their concerns over the pressing issues of their day. Uh, and, and to seek royal support in addressing them. So around uh, the 1450s, representatives of the commoners from different inland locations in Portugal started putting forward a series of grievances uh, before the, the, the Portuguese king over the installation of ditches, they call them caneros, on the banks of major rivers in Portugal. Uh, uh, they, these were installed uh, by prominent aristocrats. And they were intended to catch the run of shad that would make their way upstream, the fish that would make their uh, way upstream every year to spawn. The commoners uh, perceived that the introduction of these ditches compromised their ability to catch fish at the same levels that they had in the past. Right? In the plea that they presented before the king in 1481, they noted, quote, long ago, before there were fishing ditches in this kingdom, there was a great abundance of shad and other freshwater fish which met the needs of the land. They went on to detail in quite precise terms how a recent onslaught of ditches built along two major rivers in Portugal had proved detrimental to the life cycle of shad, leading to unscrupulous fishing techniques that netted newly hatched fish or the eggs that had been laid by mature shad. Describing the technique as unsustainable, the commoners of the Cortes generalized from a series of local circumstances across Portugal to put forward a broader assessment of the impact of a new fishing technology, in this case, the ditches, the caneros, uh, which they perceived as being harmful to the migratory pathways of shad and the communities relying on these fish. So fishermen in, in, the, in what we read in the Cortes tied their diagnosis of an ecological issue Right? Um, to an economic problem. They very clearly say severe, that severely reducing the catches of shad from previous years not only meant the impoverishment of the families depending on fisheries, but it also dealt a significant blow to regional trade. Um, prior to this new ditch digging era, commoners uh, were claiming that shad fisheries had regularly attracted merchants from afar, including neighboring Spain, Castile. Uh, and these visiting merchants had once bought fish in Portuguese mar markets through barter or hard currency. So there was an infusion of kind of foreign currency as a result of this trade. Uh, the healthy fisheries in this, in this line of argument that the fishermen presented were an economic asset to local institutions collecting taxes on the sale of fish. And so before the royal audi audience, they pled for the crown's support in reversing this trend by uh, instituting a four to five year ban on the practice in order, they very clearly say, to allow the shad population to recover. Okay. So 
you know, a more recent, uh, th this is a, some pictures of, of a, a few species of, of shad, uh, and a more recent assessment of the life cycle of shad as they cross from ocean or lake to estuary and, and river in and, and, and different phases of their life cycle. And essentially you have uh, in the pages of the Cortes, you have Iberian fishermen detailing something that very much mirrors contemporary understandings of the life cycle of marine species like shad. Okay. Now, the interesting thing is, okay, so what happens, right? Representatives of the crown hear this, okay, uh, and their response, which is also written in, in that book there, uh, it, it showed that they seemed at least partly receptive to the suggestions put forward. Uh, the Portuguese king said that uh, he would appoint a commission to engage in field experiments to study this question so that the crown might be better equipped with, and I, I like this quote uh, in, given the, the title of this lecture series, uh, equipped to find out the truth about this case. Okay. Now, this was a bit of a noncommittal response. Uh, but it shows an interesting contrast with another exchange between fishermen and the crown over the same days of the Cortes. Uh, other fishermen put forward a very similar set of complaints regarding the recent introduction of another fishing technology, in this case, uh, fence nets or acedaris, uh, along the major estuary uh, in the vicinity of Lisbon. And they argued in, in ways that, uh, that mirrored their, their uh, claims about the shad that uh, the, this new implement uh, was having a disastrous effect on the levels of sardines off the west coast of Portugal. They listed a similar set of economic concerns uh, as they had with the, with the ditches. Uh, and they also noted that fishermen uh, were now forced to procure sardines further afield, risking their lives and their boats. Uh, and, and, and they again suggested a three to four year moratorium on the implement that was being used. Okay. Uh, now, both of these pro proposed solutions reveal an astute understanding of ecosystemic resilience and, and the lifeways of pelagic fish. But in the case of this other request to do away with the use of the, f the fence nets, the plea was rejected outright by the Crown. Okay. And this was two days, like in the same set of days. Okay. The petitioners, wrote the Crown, have not sufficiently demonstrated that the fence nets are detrimental, so there will be no changes to be made with relation to this issue, said the Crown. Okay. Uh, and here you have uh, some pictures of uh, something uh, probably similar to uh, the, the type of technology that was being uh, described uh, with, with these fence nets. This is a picture from the early 20th century from the southern coast of Portugal. Uh, and you see uh, uh, a large cattle kind of hauling in a, a large net from, from, the, from, the, from the ocean there. Uh, and you see that it's a collective endeavor. Uh, and, uh, and in this case, uh, you know, obviously we need to keep in mind that this is several hundred years apart and that there would have been changes in the technology. But I think it's the legacy of... Uh, of the, some of the, the introduction of the, of the new technologies that are being described uh, you know, several hundred years before that. Uh, here you have another, uh, the tr a traditional fishing boat in, in uh, southern Portugal uh, that had been used, that the, the fishermen in the, in the 1400s talk about as having been the traditional implement prior to the introduction of those fence nets. Right, so you have different layers of, tech, of maritime technology and fishing technology uh, happening at the same time. And so a lot of these debates that occur between, you know, uh, who gets to tax what uh, and, and at what rate uh, is, is also a function of the introduction of new technologies. Uh, so so why, why did the Crown, you know, say, we'll look into it with the ditches, uh, but uh, no on the whole fence net thing? Okay? Why, why this sort of two-faced approach? Uh, here's where a, a broader Atlantic framework is useful. Okay. Um, in the same year that the, this, uh, this, new, this new fishing technology uh, was uh, that, that the fishermen from Lisbon saw as detrimental to the fisheries, um, was, was seeing its debut um, in western Portugal, it was also being introduced on the coast of southern Portugal. And, uh, and here is where we can kind of see changes uh, in popular custom as having uh, this ripple effect 
onto the regulatory framework. Okay? Fishermen on the south coast had to pay taxes not only at the time when they brought their fish to market, but also uh, prior to that when they were installing these new fishing instruments. And as I was saying earlier, the, these tax rates varied from year to year and were set and collected by different local institutions, right? Uh, in southern Portugal, the, uh, a military order um, known as the Order of Christ, uh, which had clear connection with the Portuguese crown, began to charge a fee for the installation of these fence nets on the coast. Uh, and there's a remarkable transformation in the rate at which they were taxing the, the use of this net. Between, uh, in, in 1483, they were charging 4,000 uh, reis, the currency used at the time, for the introduction of each fishing net. Uh, there, there are discussions uh, amongst the fishermen about uh, how this was, uh, the, the tax uh, uh, was, was actually uh, not in tune with the degree to which some of these, uh, the, the degree of, the number of fish that were being hauled in by these nets. There was, there's a discussion of, wow, these nets are, are bringing in a lot more fish than, than prior technologies. And so you see a change in the rate of taxation of these nets uh, in the following years so that Two years later, by 1485, what had once been a 4,000 Hayes uh, fee for in implementing the net then turns into a 24,000 Hayes fee. Okay, this is a pretty quick, uh, you know, uh, this is a regulatory apparatus that's very quick in perceiving the economic potential of a newly introduced technology. Interestingly enough, one of the people uh, involved in Introducing this, uh, this technology uh, in the southern coast of Portugal is a, uh, an Andalusian fisherman named Martin Alonso Pinzon, who 10 years later was the captain of, the, uh, of one of the ships that, uh, that made the, uh, what's considered the first transatlantic crossing with Christopher Columbus. So you see how the, the uh, debates over uh, the, the environmental stewardship involved a community of mariners that were involved in trade and other sort of uh, nascent colonial endeavors uh, during the same period, okay? Uh, and so, so with that in mind, right, it's, it's good to think about how, uh, you know, sardines um, did not content themselves solely with Iberian waters, right? Uh, and so as the, the petitioners at the Cortes had mentioned, where sardines went, fishermen followed. Right? Uh, in the late summer, Iberian mariners sailed down the Moroccan littoral, past the Canary Islands, uh, and, uh, and, and on a regular basis, on seasonal fishing expeditions. And uh, throughout this period, you have um, the, the, both the Spanish crown and the Portuguese crown selling licenses to fishermen for rights to fish off of uh, specific stretches of the North African coast. So, uh, and, and, and it's important to remember that these fishing expeditions are happening at the same time as other, uh, other types of expeditions, slaving expeditions, including uh, initiatives of uh, colonization of the Canaries uh, by, Spain, by Spain and Portugal during this period, uh, as well as the nascent economic linkages uh, with uh, West Africa uh, that, that, that in, involved the slave trade during the same period. And you have examples of fishermen involved in uh, slaving during this time as well. Okay. Uh, and and these, uh, these arrangements, these questions of, okay, who has rights to access to the fisheries are then folded into broader economic questions, very much uh, in the, the same mold as the fishermen are articulating in front of the Cortes in the 1480s. Um, in the, in the mid-1490s, uh, the, the Portuguese and Spanish crown, uh, following the voyages of Columbus, uh, create a set of diplomatic uh, agreements over, uh, that create the, a famous line of, of demarcation known as the, the line of Tordesillas, which means to separate different spheres of influence between Spain and Portugal in the Americas. Uh, at the same time, uh, during the same negotiations, they're, uh, they're creating another line that goes east-west, uh, that relates to fishing rights off the coast of, of uh, North Africa. Okay. So fast forward to uh, 20 years later, 25 years later, to the 1520s, okay. uh, and you have 
fishermen from southern Iberia, from Andalusia, um, who, are, uh, who, who are from a town called the Puerto de Santa Maria, okay? which uh, they, and this was a port that had been important in, in the regional economies in the 15th century, but that was being eclipsed at the time by the rise of Seville uh, as, uh, as a, a sort of major city, uh, drawing in a lot of the, the wealth uh, that, that, was, uh, that was being derived off of the colonialism uh, and, and plunder of, uh, of, the, of the Americas by, by different um, European actors during this time. Uh, and so during the, and th this is a, a photograph of um, s some of the evidence of this lawsuit from the 1520s involving these Andalusian fishermen that I'm going to briefly talk about. Um, and that's going to be my, my last example before kind of bringing it back to the contemporary moment. Um, so uh, fishermen from this town of, of, of Puerto de Santa Maria uh, started a lawsuit against a, a merchant guild, a merchant house called the, the Casa de la Contratación, which was essentially a, a governing board of overseas trade based in Seville that had the firm backing of the Spanish crown. Okay. Uh, now, these fishermen, uh, and you can read their, their depositions uh, throughout the lawsuit, right? they complained, uh, they, they show us once more that issues of environmental stewardship were, even in this period, thoroughly <coughs> suffused with Questions of you know what is the where where does regulatory uh, power come from? Okay, does it come from the people involved? Does it come from which institution? Uh, and does it come from economic forces? Uh, who who has the power to shape those regulations? Right, um, and and so they they were complaining of a new tax that was being collected by the officials of the the Casa de la Contratación um, that uh, there was a, a tariff basically on all. Uh, imported or exported merchandise from the ports that, that were leaving or entering the ports of southern Spain during this period. And the reason for the introduction of this new tax was a geopolitical one. Uh, the, the House of Trade was worried about uh, the sort of onslaught of, uh, of French mariners uh, dur in, in, throughout the region. They were attacking uh, many of the, uh, the Iberian fishing and, and also trading uh, fleets during this period and kind of siphoning off much of the wealth that was returning from the Americas and other parts of the world to this region uh, was being sort of siphoned off by, by many of these French mariners. Uh, and so the fishermen uh, uh, who are sort of faced with this new tax that's supposed to organize protection fleets, you know, to ward off the, the French uh, in this area are saying, okay, you know what, um, we, uh, we don't have the economic capacity to, uh, to actually um, to, to be able to pay for this tax without being completely broke. Uh, and they detail uh, how they went on seasonal expeditions to the same regions off the North African coast that fishermen from Iberia had been going at this point for over half a century. Right? And they, they talk about using traditional fishing methods, uh, including like uh, fishing by line, uh, and, and that uh, the the, uh, the fishing stocks seem depleted. They, they again, uh, propose a sort of economic argument. Uh, they say that, you know, with this new tax, we are, we're unable to, to make any profit from these fishing expeditions. We're already in, uh, going into debt in order to, uh, in, in order to uh, organize and, and, and sort of mobilize these, these voyages. And so we, we can't, um, we, we we're unable to, to deal with, with this new tax. So again, I mean, it, Hopefully, uh, with these different examples, you're seeing that these, these, uh, these concerns, these environmental concerns, folded into economic concerns, folded into political and social concerns, uh, are, are a longstanding facet of uh, human uh, and, and, and political interactions over the future of the environment. Okay. Um, there's an interesting quote by, uh, by Gonzalo Garcia, one of the fishermen uh, in, in this case, uh, where he says uh, that uh, you know, the fish that we bring back to Andalusia every year are the harvests that God gives us through our work. Uh, and he uses that to argue that, um, that the fish that is being brought back to uh, the, the Andalusian ports are not merchandise. 
as the new tax stipulates, but they're, they're actually the fruits of labor. And so therefore, uh, they shouldn't even be considered uh, merchandise. Okay. So uh, there are all sorts of uh, arguments that are being used here, but the, the, sort of the, uh, the main point to take away, I think, is this sort of collapsing of environmental concerns with economic, political, social concerns. Um, so, all right, so sort of going to a conclusion here. Um, so, as I, I hope, uh, as I hope we've, we've uh, I've been able to convey, um, regulations have for a long time been part of how people interact with aspects of their environments. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the scenario that, I, that I've sort of gone into here, uh, I think, can hold true in many different historical contexts beyond this one. Um, and I think knowing this and keeping this in mind can help do away with the false dichotomy in the current political debates over environmental regulations. Okay? Uh, you could say that there is no such thing as dismantling regulations. You know, yes, Pruitt and Trump would like to diminish the federal government's active role in regulating the environment, but they're more accurately seen to be shifting regulatory power, not only away from the government, but also away from popular interests in favor of financial institutions or uh, the fossil fuel industry, uh, the, the, sort of econo the main economic agents behind that have always been a part of, of these questions of who, who has access to uh, environmental resources. Okay? Uh, so, uh, you know, given the, the unfavorable political scene at the, at the federal government currently, uh, you know, I think policymakers' ability to shape environmental regulations, if informed by a, a sort of deeper historical perspective that I, I'm getting at today, um, should, should think of, of their, their, uh, their, their role as uh, involving, at, not only at the at level of uh, city governance, but also where local institutions uh, already overlap with popular or grassroots initiatives. Okay. In other words, drafting regulations should be uh, an inclusive uh, participatory process rather than simply a prescriptive one. Uh, policymakers should learn from the people whom they proclaim to want to help as much as, if not more so, than those people should learn from them. Okay. We have to rethink, I think, the role of popular custom. Uh, kind of applied to the 21st century as a powerful force in society that's both entrenched and adaptive to changing realities. I think the, the livelihoods of the majority of the world population, uh, if we follow the current path with greenhouse gas emissions, uh, will be severely compromised if we don't commit to fundamentally reorienting ourselves and our relationship to the environmental fabric of the planet. Uh, you know, of which we are a part. Um, so, you know, on the one hand, this, this is a daunting prospect, but I think it's a necessary one, given, given the stakes. So if, uh, if policy thinkers are, and makers are, are serious about implementing these, uh, these changes that will have the greatest uh, in positive in effect on, on people's livelihoods, then I think they should take the perspective of the most vulnerable and assailed populations first, and ally themselves to the perspective of local custom, you know, of the way that people have traditionally drawn sustenance and wealth from their environments, and what these people see as the main barriers to maintaining their livelihoods and locally derived solutions. Okay? That means that it's now more than ever critical for scientists and engineers to engage in ongoing dialogue with social scientists and humanities scholars who, have, who tackle the complexity of human life, the contradictory motives, the cultural paradigms, the social dynamics that structure and constrain actions throughout history. I think policymakers should weigh their own visions of environmental stewardship uh, with a, a historical understanding of the past and the present arrangements that amounted to regulations then and regulations now. And for those concerned with the, uh, the environmental challenges in this age of climate change, we need to be clear, right? When Trump and Republicans proclaim to slash regulations, they're in, in actuality handing over the reins to the private sector and letting capital shape and reshape regulations. So it's a, a change in the center of gravity rather than an either or of 
regulations on the one hand and a lack of regulations on the other. Okay? Uh, in other words, slashing federal regulations is not uh, a subtractive process. Uh, it means that the financial institutions and the fossil fuel industry plays the leading role in shaping and enacting environmental regulations. That means you know, short-term profit is the bottom line. And this is something that I think even the fishermen in the Portuguese Cortes of the early 1480s or uh, venturing out from Andalusia to the coast of North Africa in the 1520s would keenly appreciate. Thank you. I was wondering, well, first of all, that was a great presentation. I, I was really struck by the knowledge that the governments had in the late 15th, early 16th century about the interconnectedness of the ecosystems. Um, now, I was wondering if you have any sense of for, like, how it's even discussion of, of like, public official discussion of stripping away the powers of the EPA seems like such a huge step backwards. I was wondering if you have any sense for how that's possible. Is it just the constant pressure of private industry or challenges of globalization or the fact that for right now, for a lot of Americans, issues like climate change are still kind of abstract? Mm -hmm. or, so, so you're asking um, how is it possible that this, this, um, these arguments against the, the power of the EPA are able to take root? Like this, uh, essentially, yes. Um, yeah, no. I mean, I, I think that's a so that's there's a, a lot that can be said to that question. I think that you know uh, this is something that um, that people have different perspectives on. Um, one um, one of the, the ways that that, uh, that I think so there are different sort of time scales that, that you could use to answer that question too. So you know, on the if you if you approach it from the sort of a shorter Temporal horizon, right? You could say that um, that the, the the discourse among among the uh, the right wing uh, in in the U.S. and other parts of the world has been, uh, you know, the the sort of um, uh, not just the right wing, but frankly the, the centrists as well, uh, has been that uh, you know to to support the the free market, right? The and the sort of a neoliberal approach that says that you know. Regulations that, that sees regulations as the province of of the of the government, right, and se and sees those regulations as impeding the natural functions of of the free market. Now, this is an ideology, right? This is something that uh, that I think in the the longer uh, time scale that that I'm proposing here, um, we see that uh, that people uh, that that it's not just a matter of you know the government setting these regulations, but rather uh, that that there are uh, there are different different factions within society that enact and and react to the standing order of like what people perceive to be the rules and norms right of of, of how to interact with their environments now from this longer perspective I think there's it's a it's a question of the history of capitalism as well right um, so which, which can you know uh, there are many people who argue for understanding the framing the history of capitalism as beginning in the in the period that, that I'm talking about here, and and involving a process by which uh, the the vast majority it, it, the transition from the vast majority of people uh, making uh, making their livings uh, from you know from their the mean having the means of subsistence at their disposal, right, to one in which uh, you're you have to work a job, uh, most likely in a city, in order to receive a wage that, will, that, that you then use to buy food that somebody else has labored to create for you, right? And so I think that sort of, um, that the distance from the, 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 the means of sustenance um, creates the space for thinking about regulations as being this abstract province of Institutions and and govern and the governments, right? And so it, it makes it so that um, the the stakes of climate change are uh, less apparent, right? Uh, for maybe an urban consumer, right? Um, 
but I think I think that's changing, right? I think that people, I think, and it, it will continue to change in the in the next uh, in, the, in the the coming decades. I think, um, I think, I think there's a way that uh, that people uh, are are willing to defend the power of the state to regulate the uh, the, the environment, um, but I think that that those defenses are still uh, coming from different ideological camps. The people who will be saying, you know, uh, the, the state should take a role, the EPA should take a role, uh, should take a lead in, uh, in protecting the environment um, and, and sort of uh, make it uh, palatable to the standing econom economic order. Uh, and, and there are people who say that, that who have a deeper critique of, of, uh, of the rise of the, the historical reasons for climate change and will say that, uh, that the problem is the economic order and that we need to fundamentally rethink uh, the, the ways in which uh, capitalism works and doesn't work, right? So um, my, my contribution here is to kind of just say, okay, you know, um, we need to think a little bit more broadly about what constitutes regulation in a time when, uh, when regulation is under attack in the, in the way that, that it is. Uh, at this point. So I, I think that kind of, you know, it's not quite um, a direct answer to your question, but I think one sort of pivot is, to, is actually say, okay, you know, um, it's not whether, how does it change uh, to introduce the fact that like, that the, the claim to slash regulations is not really a claim, is not really slashing regulations, it's more just shifting the center of gravity to benefit a particular uh, elite sector of society that doesn't have, uh, you know, uh, actual concerns for the needs of the vast majority of people. Uh, and I think framing it in those terms can change the dialogue a bit. Uh, that's the hope. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Just sort of curious to think about what happened with the tobacco industry and how they were kind of taken down, right? Mm -hmm. China lawsuits and is there any precedent there that um, suggest some reason to think that perhaps fossil fuel industry might soon be having to think about something that could be absolutely crippling to them if they were held, to be held liable for mm -hmm. basically climate uh, change. Yeah, no, I, and I think, uh, so mm, th some of the interesting, um, the activism around uh, fossil uh, divestment has, um, has fossil fuel divestment, not fossil fuel. Um, yeah, divest from the fossils themselves, you know, just cut to the chase. Um, the, uh, the, some of the uh, divestment campaigns have been using the example of the tobacco industry, of the, the campaigns against the tobacco industry, saying, you know, um, the, uh, the, the goal here, you know, in addition to, uh, you know, definitely uh, hurting, uh, sort of like putting a, a dent in the... Uh, you know the the net positive column of, uh, of this fossil fuel industry in, in terms of their profits, right? Uh, there's I think I don't I think that there's uh, a recognition that that divestment has a, a symbolic uh, a, a symbolic charge to it that is akin to changing the perception of the fossil fuel industry as one that is beneficial, right? And so it's sort of tarnishing that image, and um, and it used to be I think that um, that there was uh, uh, a way that um, that the that the, the tobacco industry was seen as sort of a precedent for uh, the the fossil fuel like the, the attacks of on the tobacco industry was seen as a precedent right uh, but more recently uh, there's been uh, some interesting um, reporting by Bill McKibben uh, about uh, the uh, I don't know if people are familiar with the Exxon new campaign um, so if you search hashtag Exxon, so E X X O N, new K N E W, okay. Um, it, uh, so Bill McKibben has, has a long piece in I think Rolling Stone from last year about how um, scientists uh, working for Exxon from the 1950s and 60s were already aware of the the detrimental effects of uh, of climate change as a result of the uh, pace of extractivism of the, the oil industry um, and, um, and suppressed that knowledge for a long time and that actually the tobacco industry learned from the fossil fuel industry 
uh, to in terms of uh, sowing confusion about oh you know there are the, the linkages between smoking and cancer are unclear and, and sort of delaying the uh, the public outcry uh, by the same strategy of uh, of kind of um, you know uncertainty right um, and so uh, so it shows I think the the uh, the longevity of the fossil fuel industry's assault on uh, on uh, on people's well being. Uh, and the disregard, the sort of blatant disregard for, um, for true science. Right? <laughs> um, but uh, but uh, but I think um, in this case, um, I think that there's definitely a, a link between the two, and there's a campaign to sort of change uh, as much as like the, the divestment, uh, you know, has a, a sort of clear economic dimension. I think there's a sort of uh, a clear sort of symbolic impact of what that has, and I, I think that. Um, Groups like 350.org and, and other organizations are um, uh, are sort of trying to uh, bring together all these uh, these disparate initiatives uh, uh, and, and sort of showing making the case. You know, both the city, uh, different cities are divesting, different college campuses. Uh, I know that there's a campaign here at Drexel, uh, Fossil Free Drexel, that's that's pushing uh, the, uh, Drexel towards this uh, uh, this 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 goal. Um, Pushing towards a green campus and all these things that I think together show some real momentum in that uh, in that sort of arm of, of activism. Yeah, that group sounds really interesting. Would you be able to share, share the, like their website? Fossil Free Drexel. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for a really fascinating uh, talk. I was I kept thinking about coal miners as you were talking about sort of the labor and um, uh, the role of this, um, Populations historically that had a stake in, in the kind of sustainable resource <laughs> and stewardship of that, um, but now it, it seems like coal mining and that it doesn't sort of have the same kind of uh, it doesn't really have a parallel with that that kind of um, labor in the sense that um, it's an unsustainable um, resource that they're tapping, and now they're aligned with with capital against the regulation. So I don't know if you can comment on on whether there's uh, any kind of um, way to think about extractive industries, mm -hmm. whether they need to be thought of differently than, uh, say, fishermen or um, you know, people who are mining a, a sustainable product or, mm -hmm. or a renewable product. Yeah, um, well, so a couple of things. The, um, you know, the, the sort of, I, I don't have the the numbers offhand, but uh, but the the I, I think the current uh, political discourse around coal mining um, is uh, is a very complex issue, right? Uh, uh, I think the it, one of the interesting things that sort of contextualizes uh, the degree to which that debate has sort of taken a life of its own and is is sort of uh, uh, sort of created a, a platform for uh, arguing for slashing regulations in favor of creating jobs, right? Uh, is that the, the number of, of coal miners uh, in the U.S. today relative to the broader labor population, population is actually extremely low, right? Uh, and there is all this, this uh, writing now about how, you know, even the, the promises to bring coal jobs back uh, is, is a hollow one, um, even, even if the, the state were to uh, to sort of uh, dig down and, and kind of uh, and try to, to revive that industry um, for a series of, of different factors, right? It's it's this is not coming back, right? Um, and so I think that so th I think that's a key um, part of it in terms of uh, you know the the complexity of the situation. Like, yes, people are losing their jobs. Um, they they're economically depressed areas. Uh, and and we have to take their concerns seriously. Like there's no uh, there, there's no question about that, right? Um, and it's totally understandable that uh, that that those types of jobs uh, are are um, desired desirable uh, by by these these different community members, uh, and especially if there's it's an aspect of the, the identity of the, of the region, right? Um, and uh, but I think at the same time, right? Um, we have to kind of have a, a sort of a holistic approach to uh, you know what what's the 
the issues of, of public health in those uh, in those communities, right, as a relation to uh, the labor conditions and the sort of ancillary effects of, of coal mining in those places. And that's where I think the idea, this idea of custom and of popular custom can be useful um, in that you know, the, the historian E.P. Thompson uh, once wrote famously that custom lies at the, the interface between law and agrarian practice. Right? And that, um, so that the, the way that people traditionally, uh, but also, you know, uh, uh, traditionally interact with their environments, but also adapt to those environments is sort of at the intersection of, of uh, the, the institutional apparatus and laws and, uh, you know, um, uh, and, and the, the, on the other hand, the sort of the, the practices, that, the, the agrarian practices or the sort of um, the, the labor that they engage in on a day-to-day day -day basis, right? And th those uh, modes of, of, uh, of labor, the, those means of labor are changing now, right? So what, what jobs uh, are they are they actually going to be able to have in the next 10, 20, 30 years? Uh, and so, I mean, I think that the, um, you know, the, the argument for uh, creating green jobs is, uh, is relevant here. Um, but I think that the, the sort of the centrality of custom, uh, understanding the centrality of custom means that the solutions aren't just going to be coming from, you know, on high, the sort of creation of jobs, whether it's government jobs or whether it's, uh, you know, corporations that are somehow, you know, appearing out of thin air or, or moving in from elsewhere and creating, offering these jobs. Uh, they're, they're a function also of how people are, are organizing in their local communities and see the, the uh, desirable opportunities for themselves, right? And, and so I think um, the, the problem of, you know, the, the coal mining communities uh, and what they, what, what's next for them it needs to take seriously the concerns of, of, of that community um, and, and sort of engaging in a dialogue about what, uh, what are the, the consequences of particular courses of action. Right? So I think that there's a, there's a sense that um, you know, if, if there's a, uh, a persuasive, if people find it persuasive to say that you know, government, uh, government is, is clunky and regulations from the government are bad, um, then uh, then it's it's not going to be uh, useful, uh, at least in the short term, to say, oh, but it, you know, we have a really great policy that we're going to introduce here, and it's going to really solve all sorts of problems. People are going to resist that. So uh, so there's a a sort of openness to meeting people where they are and and to dealing with the, the problems that they um, that they they see as 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 being important. And I know that, you know the. Uh, uh, Opioid epidemics, right? Is uh, opioid addiction uh, is is rampant in many of the uh, uh, of the communities throughout the uh, the Rust Belt uh, in, in the U.S. currently, and so you know there's a the the concerns. You know, it's not strictly uh, you know in in trying to to um, to tackle the the complex set of issues uh, facing those communities. It begins with sort of this broader assessment of you know what's what's happening. What are your concerns? Uh, and, and how do we um, how do we create new coalitions to address those concerns? I guess where I struggle is trying to understand how the, um, uh, yeah, the sort of ecological awareness that, that you're talking about, um, right. where the fishermen rely on, on the fishing uh, yeah. on fish to be there when they when they go out and fish, but the the ecological consequences of in the uh, of, of the coal mining don't have an impact right there on their resources. They just want to get it out of the ground. So it's, those, those are completely, um, you know, just there's just a disjunction between those those two, um, the consequence and the um, uh, and the action of the yeah of the people who are doing the extraction. So I, I'm just struggling with how to how you get that how you get all those interests at the table um, in a way that you're kind of suggesting. Yeah. Um, uh, it just seems. <laughs> yeah, no, I think, but I, I think that in a way, I mean, yeah, I, I, I have the, I struggle with the same question. Uh, I, I think that there are, I think part of the, something that I've been thinking about is that, you know, in some ways, the, the political discourse, uh, and I think this is reflected in, in the talk I gave, is that the, the political discourse, not just in the U.S., but in, in, various contexts in the world right now is extremely polarized and 
it, there's a sense that you know um, that the minute that you you say you know climate change, you know people will peg you as a particular camp, and there's a lack of dialogue between those who ascribe to the you know denialist camp, right? Um, and and I think that it's it's up to uh, it's up to to many of us to think of um, ways that we can push some of the initiatives that we perceive as being beneficial to, to the vast majority of people uh, through new types of uh, debates over things that, you know, kind of uh, don't exactly adhere to the, the set terms of the political debate. So in a sense, uh, you know, for instance, with the coal miners, like the, already if we begin the, the, the question, the, the, the discussion on the premises of, you know, coal mining, like jobs versus environment, right, that's, that's, that seems to be, at least from what I can tell, not the, the, the sides are pretty set, right? But you know, let me give you an example. Um, I know of a, of, an, of an, a great organization um, called Put People First PA, uh, who uh, they, they're uh, they're working towards building um, uh, working class uh, alliances across urban and rural contexts in Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, small towns, uh, you know, big cities, rural, rural settings, uh, organizing uh, working people uh, around securing their means of subsistence, right? their basic needs. Right? Uh, there's a major campaign right now around health care, right? um, but they're, they're also uh, operating, they're, they're, there's also a campaign around a, um, uh, a correctional institution in uh, Fayette, uh, Pennsylvania, which is about an hour outside of Pittsburgh, uh, that was built about 10, 15 years ago on major coal ash deposits. And, uh, and at the current, at the, in, in the, the current moment, right, uh, not only the people who are incarcerated uh, in, in this facility, but also the, the guards who work there are having extremely, uh, you know, are experiencing uh, adverse health effects due to the uh, to their proximity to major coal ash deposits, and the people who live in the town uh, are also uh, confronted with this. Now, this is a this is an issue of environmental justice, right? Uh, it's connected to the question of uh, of the history of coal mining in the region, and yet. It has the potential, uh, and, and there's already sort of a movement towards that. You know, the the guards are aware of the, this as is an issue, and uh, the the people um, who are incarcerated in this context are are also aware of this issue, and so all of a sudden the the discussion. You know, if if we're if we look at at, at scenarios like this as the sort of if we begin the discussion around uh, those scenarios rather than you know, where the, the, the political discourse already creates clearly demarcated divisions and you're either on that side or, or the other, right? if we find um, you know, important uh, and pressing issues that, that tackle some of our standing concerns but from a, a different angle, I think that might at least sort of you know, jostle some of the existing uh, entrenched uh, uh, aspect of, of, of of the divisions and the polarization around these issues, uh, so that's one potential way to think about it. It's not, <laughs> it's not like a, a solution by any means, but it's I think something something to think more about. Um, I was talking about getting everybody's interest on the table. It was reminding me of a, an issue or debate I've read about in the past about the sort of the ethics, I guess, of regulations, environmental regulations in developing countries, because um, I guess it's essentially hypocritical because like our industrial revolution was powered by fossil fuels and resource ex exploitation. And um, the argument I've heard is that it's unfair to expect developing countries to uphold environmental, environmental regulations because it's a handicap for them, for their development, but on the other hand, allowing them to, or not allowing them, but not expecting them to not 
exploit their resources and use fossil fuels is sh shooting everybody in the foot in the long run. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if there are any regulations that you're aware of that have been fair and successful, or is this not even a regulatory issue and it's more the job of developed countries to sort of help out developing countries so that they don't have to lean so much on fossil fuels, et cetera? Yeah, um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I I think that yeah, this is a fraught a fraught issue that kind of gets at you know um, the legacies of uh, of the sort of colonial uh, you know uh, European imperial uh, order that, that was you know that began to emerge during the period that that I that I study right. right. Um, and and I think that yeah I think it's it's correct to be uh, to be skeptical of uh, you know both uh, nation states actors speaking on behalf of nation states in the global north um, over, over what uh, what should be uh, the course of action for countries uh, of the global south uh, that had have that have been uh, you know on the, the uh, in many cases. Um, struggling uh, and are, continue to struggle uh, with the legacies of, of colonialism, right? Um, and and there are there are critiques of uh, developmentalist institutions like the World Bank and, and IMF as sort of you know colonialism in new clothes, right? Um, I think that that doesn't that sort of that those critiques uh, have clear sort of a historical a clear historical basis, um, but you know again they. Uh, sometimes leave us sort of, uh, you know, still thinking. Okay, well, what's what's the what's the approach, right? Um, it's it's definitely still the case uh, that uh, that the the United States is uh, the the largest polluter. I mean, the, so by some metrics, China also is the largest polluter. But I, I would argue that uh, that the U.S. is should still be considered the largest polluter because much of the uh, industrial production uh, based in China is directly tethered to American consumer habits. Um, so, I mean, I think it's a, that's a debatable thing. It depends on the metrics you're using, but uh, you know, uh, by and large, I think the if if we're talking about uh, the the sort of um, meeting uh, you know greenhouse gas emission reduction targets uh, on a global scale, um, the the places to begin are, you know, the United States and, and China, um, and uh, and it's. I think in, in many cases there the question of, you know, well, what about the, uh, you know, countries in the global South that that are reliant on these uh, extractive industries? Uh, that that question gets posed sometimes before there's an adequate consideration of the role, uh, the active role that the uh, that countries like the United States is is playing in furthering the, the, the problem. And, and so, you know, so that's one, one thing to keep in mind. Um, the other thing is, is then, you know, to kind of, um, to, to take seriously uh, the, the local and regional context. Uh, so there was a, I don't know, I, I was going to talk about it, but I ran out of time. Uh, there's um, an article in the, the New York Times from, uh, uh, couple, I think, last, last week, uh, about um, overfishing, uh, Chinese uh, fishing fleets going uh, to the, the coast of West Africa. Uh, and the way that the article is framed, I think, is, is sort of very um, a symptom of, of some of the, the, the problems with our, uh, our perception of the sort of the, the, the global uh, environmental challenges. They begin by saying, you know, that Chinese fleets are going to this uh, off, the, off the coast of, of Senegal and other West African states as, because of uh, you know, corrupt national uh, governments or a, a lack of, uh, of enforcing mechanisms from West African states. Right? So already they're beginning from the, the place of you know, regulations at the, sort of the state level are dictating a lot of what's happening here, right? And uh, and then there, the article is a, is a very uh, interesting and important article to, to read. Um, you know, has uh, talks about the role of the of the Chinese state in funding these fishing fleets, 
um, and uh, in, in large part due to demand in China, but also uh, to demand in, in the United States as well, right? Um, for uh, for not just uh, you know fish consumed by people, but like fish feed for for livestock, right? and um, and the the article only gets like to the the voice uh, and then the to beginning to think about the experience of people in West Africa, in this case in <coughs> Senegal, uh, at the very end, like the last two lines of the article are like a quote by a, a Senegalese woman about some of the challenges that, that are being faced by, by fishing communities as a result of the sort of influx of Chinese ships. Right? And the article, and, and, and another point of the article says, you know, about half of the ships that are, that are sort of engaging in intensive fishing off the, off the coast of West Africa are Chinese. So, you know, that begs the question of, you know, who, who else is there? And, and also, you know, let's not, let's not begin, let, let's not end with the, the voice of the people who are being directly affected. Let's, let's bring that to sort of the forefront of, of an article like this. And let's begin the discussion around what's, what the, the present circumstances, the historical circumstances in those places have been. And, and then let's sort of understand that in the context of larger forces that are kind of sort of coming from the outside, right? So um, sort of I think there's a there's a need to really kind of take that approach and sort of begin with with the local uh, with with the, the the context of the the dyna- sort of similarly to what we're talking about with coal mining, right? We we have to reconstruct and understand uh, that world and the way that people are, are experiencing it before there can be any discussion about the role of of that of, of the dynamics in that place in the larger uh, you know global order. So I'm taking this as sort of, um, what I'm taking back is that this is sort of a dance that's happened for time immemorial. I mean, you went back to 500 years, but I mean, probably, you could probably go back even further, um, where you've got, you know, various actors on different sides of of the natural resource question. And um, I'm teaching a class right now where we just read Garrett Hardin's Strategy of the Commons, right? I'm sorry. It's an online class. I'm in all these discussion boards that are students about tragedy of the commons. But you know, his point is that um, uh, you know these actors could even be very rational. Like they're all rational. They're all trying to do what's best for themselves. And when they do a calculation, their impact on the commons versus the benefit it always works out. That makes sense. Go ahead. Even though there's a partial, you know, percentage negative, there's plus one positive for me to exert myself um, in this dance, right? Um, but then, you know, I mean, I guess Garrett Hardin's point is that as you get to, you know, the, the impact or the overpopulation, I guess is the way he puts it, then this becomes more and more of an issue and enter the need for regulations. Um, so, you know, the discussion that I've been having with my students is, is how rational is it today um, to not be factoring in um, the sort of incremental impact of one's individual actions on the commons. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's interesting as many of the students say, well, this, this doesn't apply today, because today we all know. Um, That's encouraging. We know that, you know, we, we should do that, and Gary Hart doesn't give us enough credit. Um, although, you know, my, rea- my rebuttal is, well, look around us. I mean, does that? Um, so I, I just wonder, you know, in this dance, if that's what it is. It, like, do you suspect, um, you know, some foul play at all? Or would you sort of agree um, with some of these students <laughs> that in some sense it's, it's rational behavior, but in juxtaposition with other rational actors? And, you know, hence the need for regulation is, um, you know, just, just sort of natural, but it's, it's not. Um, and, and, you know, it's going to ebb and flow, and, you know, maybe that one one force takes over for a short amount of time and then another force comes in um, and sort of kind of balances that. I mean, my position would be in the context of sort of global impacts, mm-hmm. that, that we need to have more of a sort of forceful position on that in, 
then you know it's hard to. But I'm just curious what your thought is on this. Yeah. It's just a, a dance, and we just should sit back and kind of feel like, okay, you know, we kind of lost this one, but we'll kind of gain something next because it goes back and forth. Or you know, at what point does it be? Does it sort of might it um, push us to more sort of extreme reactions and, mm -hmm. and, and behavior to try to push things in a certain direction? Yeah, I think the the key uh, in sort of um, problematizing the uh, the Garrett Hardin uh, tragedy of the Commons thesis is exactly what what you're pointing to, which is the the problem of the the rational the singular rational actor, right? The the view that um, that this is that the the Commons is approached by individuals. When if you look at Commons scenario scenarios in history where you know, resources are recognized as, by necessity, being shared by collectives, right? And uh, and therefore the needs, like the the kind of recognition of the the importance of being stewards of this shared resource, right, is is a collective one, right? People are realizing of the, not just the the interconnectedness between you know their individual their themselves individually and the environment, but that the entire community. Uh, you know, the, 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 all the fishermen are involved in, you know, uh, you know, uh, extracting the the maritime resources, right? So there is no um, individual rational actor in, if if you look at a historical context, right? Garrett Hardin is is a fable, right? And it it, it already begins with the sort of premise of the individual, which doesn't really uh, adhere to when you look at how common scenarios are resilient over time in the historical context. And so there's a, a whole critique of Hardin uh, by sociologists like Eleanor Ostrom and, and other, uh, other geographers and economists that, that kind of uh, question that very premise of, of the, the Hardin model. Um, and I think that that, um, that gives us a really kind of a clear sense, too, of the, uh, the need to... Um, on the one hand, the, the need for the importance of developing empathy for others around you, right? Uh, and, and having you know, the kind of like our empathy muscles need to, to be a little bit better if we want to sort of uh, perceive the problems that are, that are being faced as collective problems, right? And then also, you know, that using that empathy as a basis for building uh, coalitions that then address those problems not not as 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 uh, quandaries facing individuals, but quandaries facing broader collectives. So at the moment that we we begin to think more in in more collective terms, I think is one uh, where uh, where we are able then to kind of get at uh, you know reframe the the stakes of particular environmental environmental uh, problems, or uh, or to you know think about global inequities uh, you know from a sort of a, a broad, like a not a this country versus that country perspective, but you know the the working class in that country and the working class in this country is actually aligned in certain ways, right? And and so you know I think even about like um, how something like you know the um, the COP meetings, right? Um, you know, is there something uh, that you know when we think about international regulatory norms? environmental regulatory norms today, uh, is there a way, or sort of global environmental regulatory norms today, is there a way that, uh, that other institutions that are more connected to local collectives can draw horizontal connections? Sort of like a COP, uh, you know, a, a new type of COP, but not on the basis of, you know, different actors representing nation states through the UN, but you know, city officials from one city and another city in a global framework kind of coming together uh, and, and making arrangements and, and making agreements, you know, to meet greenhouse gas emission standards like from, you know, like what if Philadelphia and, uh, and you know, Dubai make a, an agreement, a, a bilateral agreement that then, that then brings in other cities and, and sort of, so thinking that, thinking of the possibilities of a global uh, regulatory perspective on environmental issues that doesn't necessarily start from 
the, the uppermost or the sort of international level, but begins connecting different local contexts, different local collectives with one another. Um, and so, so I think that that's the, the sort of the antidote to, to the Hardin approach is one that, that allows for that kind of thinking, right? Um, and, um, and I think that it's, it's time to try it more than ever, right? I have a, just a thought on that. Um, the, so the, the tragedy of the commons is a fable, but it seems to me to be very much in line with the prisoner's dilemma, just on a much larger scale, wherein the net benefit of acting on the behalf of other people, but those interests do align. Like We all benefit from living in a world with greater equity and environmental protection, even if in like in individuals' immediate future, it seems like that limits them in terms of taxes or whatever other regulations. So, but I, I, I think empathy, if we can just convince people to be more empathetic, then that would also solve the, <laughs> solve the problem. Yeah, no, I think I, it's I, also economic. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think there's, um, I mean, the, the prisoner's dilemma, yeah, Hardin is, is clearly uh, kind of drawing from, applying the prisoner's dilemma kind of approach or game theory approach to mm -hmm. this sort of common that, that is, already has this, the same kind of ideology packed into it of, you know, be, let's begin with the rational, the singular rational individual, um, and, uh, and let's sort of build out from there. And, and I think, you know, um, that's, that's not, uh, that's not, most people's experience as you know, social beings, uh, you know, is one where we are necessarily, you know, interacting with others and, and taking others' uh, perspectives, uh, you know, if not into account, at least being confronted with it, uh, whether or not you want to, you know, see it. So it's, um, I think those models are are extremely problematic and don't don't explain much about actual. Uh, Real world problems. They've they've actually I think uh, warped our our ability to, to confront uh, complex issues that okay. involve different collectives. Unlike history, which is jealous. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, right. I was going to say I'm not sure I buy that. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a shame Jake Russell left. He he works on organisms that confront this sort of thing all the time. Uh, and no one believes that those organisms are truly rational in how they do things. I mean, they, we, in fact, we submit that they are incapable of being rational about it. But nonetheless, those sorts of rules can govern how that sort of thing works. And I, I guess it seems to me the more fundamental problem here is when you try and describe the consequences of one's actions, when we get to things like environmental effects and global warming and so on and so forth, involve abstractions that you know most people can't grasp, even people who are relatively intelligent about the sort of things they're talking about. Uh, and even the people who are true experts in them you know, they may have confidence in the general direction that they will go, but they don't have much confidence in the magnitudes of the effects. Mm -hmm. And so when you're trying to describe what is, you know, a potentially rational versus irrational effect, you know, you're dealing with a lot of guesswork. Um, and when you confront guesswork with, I need a job. All right. I need money to pay for X, Y, and Z. You know, we don't have the mechanism to solve that yet. Right. Uh, and indeed, I, I kind of suspect that it's nice to talk about you know bilateral arrangements among small entities and things like that. But when you're talking about what are we going to do to prevent you know major oceanic conveyors from collapsing? Uh, I don't think that works. I, I think there's got to be something that sounds remarkably like regulation. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess uh, the my my main point is exactly that uh, that we we need to expand our notion of what counts as regulation in order to just open as many possibilities as we can to affect change, right? And so. Uh, 
it's not just bilateral agreements between small entities, but multilateral arrangements across various small entities that can ultimately bring in a whole new set of political actors that are shut out of COP meetings, right? That, that, that don't find a place at, 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 those, at those venues. And that those types of arrangements can happen at the same time as these broader you know, uh, international, the sort of uh, the regulatory mechanisms that are in place at the international level. I, it's, it's more just kind of like a, 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 a plea for uh, a more inclusive approach towards regulation that that doesn't see uh, because I, I think that, that that sort of notion that you know um, the only way to uh, to address a problem of this magnitude is to just ha put into place this uh, large uh, you know um, framework that, that that has the backing of major powers in the world that is a way of also kind of uh, distancing, uh, a whole a whole set of concerned and perhaps unconcerned uh, collectives and individuals from being a part of that dialogue and a part of of that conversation towards trying to find a, an adequate solution. You, saw, you see what I'm saying? So I do. I, yeah. I just don't know that it's going to have a major effect on the kinds of things that you need to accomplish. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think you know the fundamental problem is there aren't enough people that you can convince that their well-being is tied to this mm -hmm. to overcome the people that who, I, I hate this thing, but it, when, it, when they describe you know, the, the current election or the November election as a how, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. You know, it's not going to overcome that sort of thing. No, it, it's interesting, the, I'm thinking of the map, uh, it, um, a survey that was conducted uh, recently of, uh, you know, awareness of climate change and uh, in the, in the U.S. Um, and uh, you know, not just you know whether people believe in that climate change is real, uh, but also which the vast majority of people do, uh, but also does it affect you, right? Uh, and uh, and the, there's a map that um, that charts the distribution of people's response in the U.S. And, uh, and that the, the majority, the, the, the sort of awareness that climate change was directly affecting uh, you know, people's daily lives was stronger in the western portions of the, of the country uh, because of the prevalence of wildfires in recent years. Uh, and, and so the drought. And the drought, yeah. So the, um, I think that there's, uh, so I, I think that that kind of, challenges the notion that the vast majority of people, I, I think that there, there are ways that like people will, will become more aware uh, of, of the, the direct impacts of climate change you know in the in the future and it's it's our um, it's 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 our responsibility I think to kind of just assume that uh, that the people have the capacity of recognizing that uh, because if we you know throw our hands up and say like there's no way people are going to are going to react to it, um, then then there's then really you're kind of cutting off any possibility of uh, of coming up with a with a way of mitigating the the larger the larger problem that you want to be uh, addressing. Yeah, I don't think so. I, I really don't. Mm -hmm. I think you know at some point you've got to dig in and win. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> You know, I think we are agreeing I, about that. Yeah. <laughs> that was my question earlier about whether this is a dance that just yeah. sort of ebbs and flows or whether you reach a certain threshold where it's no longer an enjoyable dance and it becomes a war, right? And, 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 and you know, what? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I don't need to cut you off. Yeah, it, it, it's just, yeah, I, I welcome, you know, getting more people in the conversation. I think that's a great idea. But if, you know, it's great to say that all those people out west have become aware of the environmental influences on their lives, that they have. Do those people believe that they should do something that has to do with global warming and that that plays a role in how their lives are being affected right now? That's a whole different kettle of fish. Uh, but, you know, I would bet you dollars to donuts it's not motivated them to make, and, you know, and in fact, you don't have to look very hard at the political map to see that, you know, if you get off the West Coast, the people in the West don't. 
you know, support that sort of thing. And yet, and yet you have, uh, you have, in many cases, uh, new coalitions in, in terms of the uh, pipelines, uh, uh, you know, the, whether it's Keystone XL or other places uh, the, out in, the, in Western states, uh, you know, red states, uh, that where the, the pipelines are, are going through, uh, you know, different farmlands and stuff like that. You have, uh, you have people, Republican voters, who are against the, the, uh, the construction of those pipelines, citing environmental concerns. So I think that there's a, there's a way, in, in some cases, I think environmental issues have the, um, have the, the potential of scrambling some of these traditional divides. And, and I think it's just a matter of like being, keeping our, the, the channels of communication open that we can actually hear that. Uh, and, and hear the fact that there are potential coalitions to be made with um, with people you might not expect to be allied with, um, in order to then you know like keeping the, those options open as as you're thinking about then how to how to put pressure both you know through the through new means of, of alliances and through the sort of the, the the things that are currently set in place as, as being tried you know in terms in terms of the the, the cop the COP agreements and stuff like that. So, I mean, on the one hand, I think that there's like a, a certain, if there's momentum at new levels of, uh, you know, new, new organizations, new uh, initiatives, uh, new activism, forms of activism around climate change, that that can essentially have a, a sort of, put a, a new kind of pressure on these international uh, meetings, right? So, so I think that there's... I there's want to a, grant your premise. I, I just don't know that coalitions against pipelines are a good example of what mm -hmm. you're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that probably has more to do with not in my backyard than it has to do with yeah. um, you know, any ability to address global issues. I could, I, you know, an example that I won't mention where, but I was at a southern... Since this is being recorded, but I was at a southern university recently um, talking to some folks about their environmental research, just to keep it very broad. And uh, the majority of the funding, you know, the, the exciting thing going on at this university was that they were sort of flush with funding from uh, families that made most of their money from oil extraction. And, you know, so I was <laughs> curious. I was like, well, that's very interesting because th there's really amazing stuff happening at this university in terms of environmental research. Um, and behind it is money from oil extraction, right? And, you know, so I was asking a lot of questions about how, so how does that work? Like, you know, can you say certain things? Can you, and I was sort of um, very surprised to hear the reaction that I got from multiple people who didn't know each other, um, which was that, no, no, it's, it's perfectly fine, you know? This, in fact, we've got a lot of um, concern about the environment here, especially um, the folks involved in these foundations. Um, which is, I guess, to your point, right? You know, like I come in from the Northeast sort of expecting, you know, like a line drawn in the slant sand, and if you're involved in the fossil fuel extraction industry, you're an enemy and you know, everybody else is doing the environmental work. We're really, this was an example of a place where there's this commingling of interests. You know, you might say, you know, you might say it's because these foundations are trying to, you know, it's, these are philanthropic endeavors, you know, and it's a, it's a tax exempt, you know, donation to a university. Or you might say there's a personal sense of responsibility, or you might say there's sort of legacy issues in families similar to the sort of Ivanka Trump factor, you know. Um, but nonetheless, <laughs> there's environmental work funded from you know, by folks who I would not have expected. Um, and, and that, you know, it's sort of still with me. It's, it's like, so what does that mean? Um, and would I be someone sort of interested in, um, you know, I think there's sort of ethical questions to the researcher about, or at least to this researcher, about, you know, do I accept that money, knowing where it came from, to do, to answer the questions that I want to answer. Is, it very, is that an ideal, as you said, is that like an ideological principle, an overly principled position? You know, or are we at the point now where we got to make do with what we can and we need progress and so we have to sort of overcome those divisions and sort of think more in this network sense? Mm -hmm. um, I don't have an answer, but I... Yeah. 
Yeah. I was shocked, though, honestly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This. All right. Cool. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Next week, to those of you tuning in online, we're talking changing gears to LGBTQ issues.